Good evening, everyone. My name is Connor Moran. I'm the director of the Wisconsin Book Festival. We are delighted this evening to be hosting Paul Begala for his new book, You're Fired. Um, there are very few events that um, become as timely as this one has become. It seemed like it was just going to be, you know, a day in September, a couple of weeks before the election. And now we have Paul here to talk to us uh, before he goes on CNN to talk to the country about um, the political stakes of our current moment. Um, I want to thank David Marinus for being here tonight uh, to moderate this conversation. David, as you know, is an associate editor of The Washington Post, um, a Pulitzer Prize winning author and a great friend to the Wisconsin Book Festival. He has done at least 10 of these um, interviews while I've been the director and I'm sure many more in the 10 years before me. Um, so it's wonderful to welcome you both from the Mid-Atlantic. Um, I also just want to take a moment to thank Madison Public Library and the Madison Public Library Foundation. Um, they have been incredibly stalwart in their commitment to these free cultural events throughout the quarantine and um, we don't see an end in sight. So please, um, you know, come back. Uh, we have 40 events over the next six weeks. Uh, many of them political. We have former Representative Katie Hill. We have Jennifer Palmieri. Um, we have Nikki Giovanni, who promises me that she'll get political. So um, a lot of great content going on um, in the next few weeks. Thanks so much, Paul and David, for being here. Take it away. Hi, thank you. Hello, Wisconsin. Virtually, uh, this is virtually David Marinus with virtually okay. Paul Begala. Um, and, you know, I spent eight years of my life uh, in Texas for the Washington Post, traveling the length and breadth of that great state, which I think Paul would agree has the best and some of the worst of America in it, and is just teeming with colorful characters, uh, one of whom is Paul Begala, uh, who I sort of consider the happy warrior of modern politics. Um, he was born in Sugarland, Texas. Also, uh, I'm sure he's not too proud of the fact that it's also the home of Tom DeLay, who I spent a year writing about and called the hammer. Um, but Paul went to the University of Texas in Austin, uh, went to law school in Austin, which we Madisonians think of as the Madison of the Southwest, <laughs> um, although it has better food and music, I have to say. <laughs> Um, so anyway, it's a delight to be with you, Paul. And of course, you know, there's not much to talk about, right? <laughs> no. Um, no. I mean, every, it seems like every time we hit bottom, another trap door opens. That's a great way and, to put it. And, and this last trap door is a tragedy of great proportions. But your book, You're Fired, has a chapter um, called Balls and Strikes and Other BS, in which you write that War, Clausewitz said, is politics by other means. And you say, and so is the Supreme Court. Um, Republicans have long known this. Democrats have long pretended not to. Well, all of that's got to change. Talk to me about what you think is happening right now politically with the Supreme Court. Does that well, happen? it does have to change. First, I actually remind my matters. Thank you. Thanks, Connor. <laughs> Thanks to the Wisconsin Book Festival. David, thank you. I, 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 you know this, but you're, the audience should know. I love and admire Marinus. And uh, seriously, to sit here with my pathetic scribblings, talking to a guy that wrote Pulitzer Prize winning books, and I devour everything you do, David, and you're just such a star. I, I really am grateful that you're willing to lower your standards uh, to <laughs> hang out with the likes of me. Well, for a Texan, I'll do it. Um, okay, so uh, yeah, I, I did. I have a whole chapter on the courts there because I do believe on this one, the Republicans are right and the Democrats are wrong. The courts are a political instrument. Now, they're not elected, but it's, it, it is a political instrument. The and I don't mean to like shock people. The Supreme Court is not the nine best constitutional scholars in America. They're the nine most plausibly credentialed lawyers connected to the party in power at a moment of vacancy occurred. That's what it is. And sometimes you get greatness. I think Justice Ginsburg was one of them. Sometimes you get really awful people like Brett Kavanaugh. Just, he was a horrible person. I, and I say that on the record, say it anywhere. Um, so the Republicans understand this. We now are on the precipice. Should Mr. Trump get this uh, next uh, confirmation, this next uh, vacancy confirmed, we will have a court, the majority of which, five members of the court will have been placed there by presidents who initially came to office without the support of the American people. Mm -hmm. 
and confirmed by a Senate that is so stacked in favor of small states that a small minority of Americans uh, represented by the senators who confirmed him. This is a crisis of legitimacy for the court. And it's brought about in part, as I say, because, and I, I really mean this, the Republicans understood how to fight about the courts, the Democrats didn't. Uh, I had one, wait, I'm going to see my notes here. Uh, one member of the Senate Judiciary Committee told me this yesterday. I, he did not let me use his name, and now I've told you his gender. Uh, he says, the Republicans take us for patsies, and too often they are right. Uh, it, this suggests that they're ready to change, uh, the Democrats, and I, I think they are. I mean, my own view is too often Democrats take a, take a yoga mat to a gunfight. Uh, but I, I, I don't know that they can win this. I don't think they can in the near term, but I do think they understand, even before the tragic loss of Justice Ginsburg, the number three issue for Democrats was the court. Very different from 2016. It was, of course, COVID and the economy and then the courts. In fact, for the first time in my memory, more Democrats care about court appointments than Republicans. Mm -hmm. This has never been the case in my career. This is before Justice Ginsburg passed. Now it's gonna go through the roof. So in 2016, late... it was just the opposite, right? A absolutely. And, and I have the data in the book, I don't have it in front of me, but the, yeah. the Republicans, far more Republicans voted based on the court than did Democrats. Those Republicans were smart. They were rewarded. Like Nobody thinks that Trump is particularly pro-life. I mean, he's been all over the map on the issue. He's, he's, as, as they say, he's not pro-life or pro-choice. He's multiple choice. But he has governed in a way that will overturn Roe. Roe is going to be gone because Trump got elected. Now, there's a great many Americans who think that's a good thing. And they were willing to stomach Mr. Trump's eccentricities or his vile comments or his racism even in order to get that goal. I think Democrats need to be similarly committed to understand. I mean, here, Bill Clinton's been out of office for 20 years. And on Friday, he still had an appointment to the court uh, who we were honoring. And there's still one more of his justices, Stephen Breyer, still serving after a quarter century so that is the legacy. And, and Trump has confirmed more judges, trial court and circuit court, than any first-term president in my memory, far, far more than, than Obama or Bush or Clinton. Uh, so he's reshaping the judiciary in, in his uh, inimitable fashion. And Democrats better get in the game. So your book um, presumes to have answers for a lot of the issues and you know how Democrats should deal with it. This one has sort of two sides to it. One is how should they deal with it in the campaign? And then if they win, what should they do? So take us through both of those. Well, I think in the campaign, you're watching. This is a really interesting tussle among the Democrats because there's the sort of the yoga mat Democrats who are like, oh, this is fair. Oh, the process is unfair. Okay, that's not going to get them anywhere. I have anything to write, but just because you're right doesn't mean what you should say 43 days before an election, right? I think a far better argument is to talk about people's lives. It's the whole thesis of this book. This court, I believe this deeply. And this is, I'm not a reporter, but I have talked to several Democratic senators since Friday uh, and, and some senior staffers, but members of the Senate themselves. And, and what they are telling me is, some of them at least, believe that the target date here is not even November 3rd, it's November 10th. November 10th is the day Texas versus California comes up for oral arguments. That is the case that can throw out Obamacare. The trial court in Texas did throw out Obamacare. The Fifth Circuit just sort of kicked it back and told the judge to mull around with it. Democratic attorneys general, that's why it's California, came to the court and said, look, will you resolve this? The court has within its power on November 10th to throw out the Affordable Care Act and its protections for pre-existing conditions. I believe if Trump gets this nominee through, they will do so. And uh, I think that that's gonna, that should be what they talk about. Like, this isn't about esoteric questions of, of of the propriety of comity and when you should you know, nominate a judge. And it's certainly not about hypocrisy, which is endemic to the profession. Uh, I think it should be about your right. The majority of Americans have a pre-existing condition. People have been turned down for healthcare because they had acne as a kid. Women, literally the National Women's Law Center, I say this in the book, did a study where they found that being a woman was often considered a pre-existing condition. Women were simply denied for being a woman. So this has consequences for every single American. And if you don't have a pre-existing condition, wait around, you'll get one, God willing. Because <laughs> as we age, it's 85% of people over 50 have a pre-existing condition, and I'm over 50. So this is what I think Democrats ought to do, fight it about people's lives. And yes, Roe matters. And yes, marriage equality matters. And yes, labor rights matter. And yes, environmental uh, issues matter. 
uh, but we have to make sure that they matter in a way that people understand in their lives rather than just the esoterica of the latest uh, norm breaking in Washington. So any ads that quote all of the Republican senators from what they said earlier, um, you think is a waste of time? I do, David. Because it's I do. a more serious case than that. Yeah. Right. And, you know, we wear different hats. I no longer run campaigns. OK. And I do work at CNN. We're going to run all those clips because it is it's a video. It's irresistible. And it's so blatant. And it's yeah. hypocrisy. And as you know, journalists love covering hypocrisy because it's, it well, it's drives them it's, crazy. It never ends. Well, but also you guys, your highest value is telling the truth. And so yeah. it really drives journalists crazy right. when someone doesn't tell the truth. Right. But I honestly, for voters, they'd rather have politicians who don't lie. But it's more important to them that like they can continue to get health coverage for their daughter who has asthma, you know, or their, or their sister who, who has had breast cancer. And if this happens, what do you what would you like the Democrats to do in response? And what do you think they most likely will do? Boy, again, let me go to my notes from these uh, conversations I had. People are saying court expansion is a possibility that we'll have yeah. to talk about. And these are that's not the, the person I quoted before uh, talking about how the Republicans think we're patsies. That's from a very moderate Democrat in the Senate, very institutionally focused Democrat. Uh, I, I, I guess they know, I, McConnell's a bright guy, but I hope they understand how shattering this would be for Democrats. And I mean Senate Democrats. I don't even just mean walking around folks. I, I think that um, the, the pressure to change the composition of the court will be almost irresistible. Walter Dellinger, Duke University, former yeah, Solicitor great. General, one of the great constitutional scholars, he made this point recently, before Justice Ginsburg passed. He said, you know, you, ha you, you can only, you can, the Constitution doesn't dictate how many justices we have on the court, but statute does. And if you want to change a number of justices on the court, you have to pass a law. But Mitch McConnell did it on his own. He changed the composition of the Supreme Court from nine justices to eight for a year with scores of vital cases coming forward without a single vote from a single member of the House or a single member of the Senate. That's a pretty good point. And so I think that changing the composition of the court uh, is definitely something the Democrats ought to look at. But even if I don't think they ought to, I know they will. Uh, and so the Republicans better really be careful what they wish for. You know, <clears throat> Your book starts, um, of course, with uh, a mea culpa, <laughs> uh, which sort of surprised me that you forgot the first rule of Clinton politics. <laughs> <laughs> it's terrible, David. Um, you know, it, it, I did, though. Um, and I know I wasn't the only one, but, uh, you know, I have to be accountable yeah. for my mistakes. I was helping to run a super PAC that raised and spent $190 million, and our only mission was to attack Trump. You talk about a target-rich environment. I was like a mosquito in a nudist colony. Like anywhere I land, it's going to be fertile territory. But where I landed was on character. And I, everything we said was true. I, I proudly defended it. I thought they were creative executions that our ad team did. But ultimately, it was simply about him. And I didn't tie it into how those character flaws would hurt you. I didn't close the loop. I didn't make it about the voters. And, and it was a terrible mistake because every narcissist wants to talk about himself and they don't care if it's good or bad. And I, I just really wish I, I, and by the way, I think Biden's doing a great job of this, of taking it back to voters rather than only talking about Trump's a pig, Trump's a pig. Um, I, I don't, it, it, he, it, I think some of it's intentional. Some of it's just actual, right? I think he really is a loathsome person, but I think some of this is division for diversion. So I went back and looked. When Hurricane Maria was bearing down on Puerto Rico, you know what Trump did? He didn't preposition FEMA. He didn't warn people. He didn't get generators ready on, on, on landing crafts. He attacked Colin Kaepernick for taking a knee during a football game. Now, did he mean that? Oh, yeah, he meant it. I don't think he's very much appreciative of African-American protesting police brutality. But I, it had the effect of distracting me and everybody else off of the hurricane and the damage to Puerto Ricans. So in the election... That's what I did. And, and I, you know, I have the, it's a mythologized story, but I, I, I imagine a farm family in Wisconsin, like my wife's family, uh, watching our ads as Target State. And I can see Ethel turning to Harold and saying, well, you know, well, gee, Harold, we can't vote for a fellow like that. And Harold's saying, well, yeah, he seems awful. Then three or four days before the election, Harold says, well, you know, he's not going to grab you by the privates, Ethel. But he says he's going to reopen that factory where they laid off our son, Harvey. 
And that's what I got wrong, David. I didn't tell Harold and Ethel why this is their life that will be harmed. Now we see it. We have 200,000 dead because of this man's lies and his lack of character, right? We have 15 million people lost their jobs, 10 million lost their health care. The consequences are real. I didn't do a good enough job of telling about it. So I'm, this is my mea culpa. I'm trying to make up for it with the book. And, and, uh, and I do think Joe is really doing a good job of that. Well, someone already asked this question on the chat. So, and it sort of, it puts context to everything we're dealing with. It might be an unfair question, um, but do you think members of the Biden campaign have read your book? <laughs> um, oh yeah. Yeah. I don't want to reveal confidential conversations, David, but I, I, I you know, this is because I've done this all my life. I've known Joe yeah, Biden since 1986. Right. Okay, I, I, I've known Mike Donlan, his chief strategist right. since before that. I've known Rochetti, Anita Dunn, Jen O'Malley, Dillon. I mean, so yeah, yeah, they've, they've read it. I'm not saying that they, they, they right. didn't need this. They're a lot smarter than I am. But yeah, right. it definitely- well, You're I, look, not I just going it. in the wind. That's, yeah, that's I, I wrote it thinking about those right. gals and guys. And so, you know, applying know. that Clinton law to each of the different serious issues here is really what the book does. Right. So let's take them. I mean, even since your book came out, there's so much that's happened, right? I mean, on coronavirus, the Woodward book's out, yeah. you know, yeah. sort of uh, with the with the tapes. It's I think it's amazing that Woodward's career started with tapes and now <laughs> 50 years later, <laughs> here come the tapes again. Um, but taking that issue as it is now, how do you apply the Clinton law of politics and how do you frame that issue in the campaign? It's a, and I think those tapes really are damning, as you're right, as, as Woodward's tapes were on Nixon. But this time it was the president calling Woodward yes. and convicting himself. Of, 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 Woodward was on CNN this afternoon telling Wolf Blitzer, it's as if Nixon had FedExed the tapes to me. <laughs> Trump calling him. And I think it's this. When he's talking to his fellow millionaire Ivy League elite, Bob Woodward, he tells him the truth. Dear God, Bob, this is dangerous. It's five times more deadly than the flu. It can be transmitted through the air. Be careful. But when he's talking to his supporters, he lies to them because he doesn't give a rip snort about them. He doesn't care if you live or die. He cares about his fellow elites. He wants to impress Woodward because he's Woodward's a terrific journalist and a famous guy, but he doesn't care about you. That's why he lied because he just doesn't care. He thought it served his purposes and he didn't care if you lived or died. There's another revelation, not from Woodward, but from a, a, a woman who, uh, Olivia, I can't recall her last name, who served on the coronavirus task force. She was Vice President Pence's- Oh, Troy, uh, yeah. Uh, Olivia Troy? Yeah. And right. she said that the President of the United States said, maybe coronavirus is good because I don't have to shake hands with those disgusting right. people. Now, yeah. we all recoiled, and I have in the book, when Hillary called some Trump supporters deplorable. Big mistake. No one wants to be called deplorable. And by the way, it, this is a pro tip. If you tell people they're deplorable, they tend not to want to vote for you. Who knows? But he called them disgusting, his supporters. And I think that that is a window into why he's allowing 200,000 people. To, as we speak, he's holding a rally. Um, and he's not social distancing. He's not making sure they wear masks. He doesn't care. And at a previous rally, he was asked by a journalist whether this was safe. You know what he said? Oh, I'm a long way away from them. They can't get me sick. Oh my gosh. So that's, that, this is what coronavirus does. It, it brings into stark relief what I failed to make explicit in the 2016 campaign, which is this guy's flaws can cost you your life or your livelihood. And it, we're not playing around. This is not, as I've famously said, show business for ugly people anymore. This is your life. You know, in a larger sense, um, a lot of us are sick of the interviews with uh, Trump voters and diners. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, but nonetheless, um, as you say, you know, there are ways to try to get to some of those. I mean, are there any of those voters left who you can get to? Absolutely. I mean, it seems like such a cult. Absolutely, though. It, the, the, the most hardcore, no. Right, you know, and so he'll have 35, 40% of the country with him, no matter what, he could shoot someone on Fifth yeah. Avenue. I think this obsession though about the Trump base is not analytically interesting because they're not going anywhere. They're not moving. And so why am I interested in them? You know, I think, I do think some of them are my family, okay? They're lovely people. I mean it, 
You know, my little brother voted for Trump. Um, and he's one of the best people I've ever known. And not a prejudiced moment in his body, by the way. His wife is a Venezuelan immigrant, okay? So you can't just say they're deplorable. You can't just say they're racist. But there, there's a, some of them who are more secular, who are more female than male, who are remorseful. They, are, they're, they have terrible buyer's remorse. And uh, some Democrats are targeting them in Wisconsin, in Michigan, in Pennsylvania, some in Florida, and giving voice to their concerns. And, and the way they're doing it, I think, is very smart. It, they're, they're just running ads of people speaking their mind. It's not some voice of God announcer. It's not uh, some famous actor. It's just these folks. It's like the guy climbs off his tractor and says, yeah, boy, I voted for him, and he's destroyed my farm, and I'm never going to do it again. Um, they are. And, and you know, if you look at it in terms of data, as I say, they tend to be more secular. By the way, they tend to be pro-choice. They are, it's not all of them, but a good 25% in Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, 25% of the people who voted for Trump were pro-choice. Well, they'd have to be if 70% of the people are. Right, right. Yeah, right. And, and they, now they didn't like immigration. They loved him on trade. They really, really wanted, as one Trump strategist told me, he said, what people really wanted from Trump was a big middle finger to Washington. And there are enough people who sort of convinced themselves, look, he's not really going to overturn Roe. Come on, he's a New York guy. He's like totally not really an evangelical. Those people now are in play. And Biden, God bless him, he's, he's going after him exactly the right way. You, see, you hear him the other day when he said this is about Scranton versus Park Avenue. Right. You know, Scranton well, Tufts versus... I thought maybe Paul Begala wrote that. Not me. I'm out of the business, David. I'm out of the business. I'm just like a, a pathetic uh, has-been writer, <laughs> has-been strategist trying to become a writer. Uh, no, that's, but that, I think that's, that is, I don't know him as well as some, but I've known him a very long time. He did the town hall meeting with Anderson uh, Cooper a few days ago, yep. and he turned to Anderson, who is one of my favorite people, one of the best journalists, and Dalton School, Yale, you know, very, very well educated. And he said, you could see the grievance. It was real. He said, you know, all you guys say about me that I didn't go to the Ivy League. And so somehow I'm not worthy. Oh, I'm going to be the first guy since Humphrey who didn't go to an Ivy League school and was running for the Democrats. I'm proud of that. I wear it as a badge of honor that I went to University of Delaware. I mean, it was, I don't know if you saw it, David, but it was, I thought no, I great. Did. Yes. Yeah. I thought it was yeah. great. That's yeah. Joe Biden. Believe me, that wasn't scripted by anybody. He's got that Scranton Irish chip on his shoulder that I love. Yeah, Biden is doing that pretty effectively in a way that Hillary was not able to do. Um, and right. Bill well, was able to do it too. He, he was. I, I think that part of what we got wrong in 2016 also that I've learned from the Lincoln Project, and I talked to those guys because I'm out of the business, I talked to everybody. The Lincoln right. Project folks have been highly influenced by the writing of Ann Applebaum, your colleague at the Post, yep. who uh, has analyzed authoritarians and their appeal. And when you say an authoritarian is a bully, his supporters love it because they want a bully. He's our bully. And so Democrats have largely stopped doing that. And I certainly have. And instead, you watch Lincoln Project and look at Joe. When he denigrates Trump, it's because he's a wimp. He's a Park Avenue posh, right? Not, oh, he's a big bully strongman. It's like the guy can't walk down a ramp. He can't drink a glass of water. You know, and that's a far more effective way to take him apart. And it happens to be true. You know, Cadet Bone Spurs not exactly cover himself with glory when uh, he compared my father-in-law's service in Vietnam to combat tours with fighting off STDs at Studio 54, which is what Trump was doing at the time. You know, I'm glad you mentioned uh, the Lincoln Project because whatever one would think about some of the pasts of some of those people. <laughs> they have, in my opinion, done by far the most effective social media and advertising of this campaign. Absolutely. How does that make you feel as a Democratic consultant and Great. why are they so good at it? Great, because they know the mindset of the audience they're trying to reach, uh, uh -huh. which frankly, it's a lot of liberals who fund them. And then, <laughs> I don't fund them, but a lot of liberals who do. And then the conservative former Trump voters, you know, who they're trying to reach. They know that world better than I do. And I think on both sides, I, I had this conversation with Stuart Stevens, who has a terrific new book out, by the way, called It's All a Lie. Yep. It was all a lie. Um, and, you know, I sit there and watch them and I do. I, I think this is healthy. I tend to think my adversaries are 10 feet tall with an IQ of 300. 
uh, because I do think they're formidable. These are impressive people. Stewart or Rove. Rove's not a Lincoln Project guy, but I've done you know a lot of work against <laughs> Carl. Steve Schmidt. George Conway was trying to put my boss in jail when I was in the White House, and now I'm texting with him. <laughs> it's like unbelievable. <laughs> Uh, so I, I, I have a high admiration. Stewart said the opposite about us. He's like, you guys were always better at this than us. Really? And I was like, what? And he said, look, you've won the popular vote six out of the last seven times. It's never been done in all of American history. So I actually think your team's pretty good at this. I don't view my team that way. I mean, you heard, it's like the first thing I said was that we bring a yoga mat to a gunfight. Um, but th there, uh, I hope that I have that much character and integrity if and when this happens in my party. You know, when they were putting up Trump, I was gleeful because I'm an idiot. Oh, God is good, but he's not that good. He's not going to give Hillary Donald Trump. She'll just wipe the floor with him. And my <laughs> wife from Baraboo, Wisconsin, she said, I hope she's not listening because this is, she probably wouldn't like it if I said, she said, oh yeah, what would you be doing if the Democrats were putting up Farrakhan? Now, I think Farrakhan is a different type of person than Trump, but she picked like somebody who was obviously anathema to me. And I, you know, I thought, oh my gosh, that's what so many of these really principled Republicans are dealing with. A party that they believed in all their lives has been hijacked. And um, I think that it can't be easy for them. It really can't. It's easy for me to dump all over Trump. It's easy. But they've shown a lot of, of courage. And this is a situation, so many people are saying, where you need a large, broad, united front. So to take your allies where you can get them. Oh, a hundred percent. Yeah. I, I'm, you know, I'm a faithful Catholic. Every, every, every saint has a past, every sinner has a future, you know, I'm totally, I, I got no bones to pick. I, I was terrible, bitterly against the Iraq war. Bill Crystal, who's with the Lincoln project was right. one of the chief cheerleaders. I don't care. I don't care. Mm -hmm. I have to look forward, not back. Yep. Now you say that there's no such thing as a silver bullet, but you claim that there is one. I'm not sure. I'm a little, I think there might be things that are more important this year, but tell me what you think it is. I think Democrats should point out that Trump wants to cut Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security. It's the most popular thing the federal government does. Uh, and it disproportionately helps Trump voters, which I'm all for. Um, and he has proposed in his last two budgets, $2 trillion in each budget cut from Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid which happens to match up exactly with how much he uh, gave to corporate America in his tax cut. That's why he's doing it. He's not doing it because he cares. He's not like he's a principled conservative that doesn't think there should be socialized retirement. It's that he's got to pay for his corporate tax cut somehow. And so in his budgets, he calls for deep, painful cuts. Then, God bless him, transparent man that he is, he goes to Davos, hanging out with the billionaires and brags about it. And we have that conveniently on videotape. I don't think the Democrats have done enough to raise that because I think they view it as sort of old school meat and potatoes and what's new. No Republican, no president, no Republican president ever promised cuts like this, ever. I mean, Ronald Reagan, who's 20 times the politician that Trump ever was, never proposed cuts like this in Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid. And I think we don't get to it because we're distracted by all of his other stuff. So I do, I really, I mean, you, you tell even a Trump voter, now not the most committed, but uh, weakening Trump voter. Oh yeah, his budget would cut your social security, Medicare and Medicaid by $2 trillion. And by the way, since I wrote the book, he's proposed eliminating the payroll tax which funds social security, which means social security will be at $0 in three years if he makes that thing permanent. Uh, three the reason years. I said I was dubious, Paul, is because I believe that Walter Mondale and Michael Dukakis tried to make that their issue and did, <laughs> where did that get them? So I, you know, it might, if everything else is equal, it might be a silver bullet, but. Yeah, but sure. I don't think they did it. Well, first off, Mondale, poor guy, didn't even get a fair look. Right. Country's moving in the right direction. We had a president, it, it just, it didn't matter. It was like Clinton's reelection where Dole was a terrific guy and a war hero, but nobody even cared. I think Dukakis allowed Bush to set the agenda in that race. He could have made it more central, but he sat back and let Lee Atwater make the election about flags and, 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 and school prayer and cops. Anyway, but I, yeah. I, for me, I, and a lot of this is data driven, but also I live in the world. I have a guy I go hunting with in South Texas named Ted, very, very conservative, Mexican-American, very, very conservative, loves Trump and loves Trump on immigration. 
loves Trump on immigration. Yeah, there's some absolutely. So we're out in the field, and he knows like what I do. God, he's loading me up with the Trump stuff, which is brave because I've got a high-powered weapon in my hands. <laughs> but he, you know, he's a good, he's a great. Well, guy. So does he. Exactly. And so he's a great guy and we're friends, but he's going on about this. And I tried that though. I said, and he's, I'm about to turn 60. He's probably 65 to 70. I said, you know, I don't know if you saw Ted, when Trump's budget, he's cutting social security, Medicare, Medicaid. And he stopped in his tracks. He said, then I'm out. That was it. And I think there's a lot of people that way. They may like him on trade or immigration or something, but holy smokes, you know, the majority of people in nursing homes are, are only able to pay the bills because of Medicaid. You can't do that to people. I'm glad you mentioned Bob Dole because it reminded me of the 1996 campaign and yeah. um, President Clinton's uh, famous line about him being the bridge to the 21st century, which seemed like a long way off then, you know, and yeah. now <laughs> 20 years into that century, did you ever imagine that that bridge would lead to Joe Biden? No, no, isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? Who today is older than the guy who retired from the presidency 20 years ago? Yep. That's astonishing. But I think, and I never worked for Biden, but I worked for Gephardt in 88 and traveled with him. I was a speechwriter and traveled with him. So I saw Biden a dozen times, more, a million times. And he was, I thought, very gifted, but didn't even make it to the Iowa caucuses. That race flamed out. Then he ran in 08 against Obama and Hillary didn't win a single no state, yeah. but the man and the moment came together. So the same yeah. guy who did so terribly in 88 and 08, he won 45 states this time around. And I just don't think we give him his due. That's a lot better than Bill Clinton did, a lot better than Hillary Clinton did, a lot better than Barack Obama did. He is the dominant figure in the Democratic Party today. And I think it's because the party thought hard about this and they had a really talented field, maybe the best field they've ever put on the, on the, on the field but they decided they wanted reconciliation more than revolution. And that was not a foregone conclusion to me. I, I, I could have easily seen them say, okay, you have your middle finger to Washington, here's ours. Um, but they didn't. And I, I think that's why he's leading and very consistently leading uh, against Trump is that he offers almost a perfect antithesis. And Axelrod's law is when we fire a president, it's because we want the remedy, not the replica. I think Democrats are very wise to pick the remedy here, the most opposite anti-Trump guy you could be. Of course, the paradox is that when and if he becomes president or when, he might have more freedom than yeah. Clinton or Obama to actually do some revolutionary stuff or at least more powerful change. Isn't that incredible? That is, this is a gift of the Trump era, is that the Overton window of what's acceptable has really expanded. Uh, and, and so, um, you know, I'm much more of a moderate incrementalist, maybe like Biden, but boy, all of a sudden, I'm, even my approach, much less the younger, more progressive, the AOC folks, my kids, you know? They, so I, you're right, he, he may wind up being a significantly more progressive president than Obama or Clinton could have ever dreamt. Wouldn't that be amazing? And Joe's always been a very moderate guy in the Senate. He was never on the, on the far left. Right. Um, not only did Clinton not really make climate change one of his top issues, but Al Gore didn't either in 2000, and he invented climate change. Yeah. Um, so how do you push that issue this year? Is the time come, and what do you do? Yeah, I think, you know, on Gore, that was one of the big reasons Clinton picked him, is he read Earth in the Balance, and he loved it. Yep. 91, right. Gore writes this book, Earth in the Balance, is the planet's on fire. He was so right. And Clinton did not either have deep expertise or a great record as Arkansas governor, as you know, right. on environmental yeah. stuff, because he was, he thought he had to make the trade-off for jobs. Well, he was surviving. Yeah. Right. So he was really drawn to Gore's expertise and passion on the environment. Um, but him not, Gore not running on 2000 was a colossal mistake, because it was central to who he was. And even if it didn't poll well, he should have run on that, because it's what he actually believed in. Um, so how we do it today, again, you got to make it about people's lives. Um, I very much think rather than running as scolds, you're evil people because you consume carbon and you must burn for your sins. <laughs> you know, I'm not a Calvinist. I'm a Pope Francis Catholic. And there's a huge win in this. And if I could tweak it, I wouldn't call it the Green New Deal. And I think it goes far beyond the, the needs of climate, childcare and all kind of stuff that we may or may not 
I, I would be for, but whatever. I'd call it green new jobs. That, that, and, and, and Bill Clinton taught me that. Every generation or so, you need a whole pot of new jobs. And we need them now with uh, not only the crash of, of COVID, but the AI is sapping us. Artificial intelligence is sapping us. Automation of lots and lots and lots of jobs. Um, retrofitting buildings, right? Putting in, uh, upgrading the grid. All these things would create millions of jobs. That's the next. So I, I would make it green in terms of money. Uh, I do think Democrats talk about it much better than they used to, but I would urge them to get out of their scold mentality and into the whole, we're all going to get rich. This is going to be great. And I argue with my Republican friends and they say, that, oh, it's not real. And I say, well, even if I'm wrong, what's the downside? All we do is get more energy independent, cleaner air and water and millions of new jobs. Like, so what's the downside? Well, <laughs> that, I mean, that you even have to make that argument is preposterous when you think about the downside the other way. Well, it is, and and I, you which know, I we see every you know with the hurricanes and the forest fires and well, yeah, and I think I, I think maybe this is a way to do it is to yeah. talk to your children and talk to your parents. So my mom is eighty four, and she told me the story that her grandfather. So now we're going back well over a century. Was yeah. an ice man in New Jersey. He's an ice man, Watson G. Howell, and my uncle George still has the tongs and the big leather apron and these stories that he would take blocks of ice, you know, ship them into New York City pick up 50 pounds, put it on his shoulder, walk up three or four stories in a tenement and give them their block of ice. This was in Lake Hopatcong. Well, and my mother remembers as a child going up there where her grandfather had a cabin. And then she went to summer camp at Lake Hopatcong. So this is a big thing in her childhood. Mm -hmm. It turns out that the Post sent Juliet Iperin and some other journalists yep. to Lake Hopatcong because Lake Hopatcong has already crossed the three degrees Celsius threshold after which we're screwed. And they found not only does nobody take two, two foot deep blocks of ice out, they can't even ice fish at all. They've canceled 11 out of the last 12 ice fishing. It was the ice fishing capital of that part of the country. Um, and in the summer, you can't swim in the lake that my mother swam in as a child because you get this terrible algae that can cause neurological damage. It can kill well, your We dog. know about that in Madison. <laughs> Is that right? Oh, yeah. Well, in Austin, in Town Lake, well, now Lady Bird Lake, this woman uh, lost her dog. She threw a ball in the lake, the dog yeah. swam out in the lake, the dog came back and died because of the algae bloom. So that stuff then matters, right? If you, if you talk to your mom and talk to your kids, the, the, those of us in that sandwich generation, they both seem much more plugged in on this. And it's a better way to talk about it, I think, than again, just charts and graphs and stats. You know, going back to that first discussion about the Supreme Court, you, it, there's something even larger than the Supreme Court at, at stake here. When you mention how most of the majority of the justices were appointed by presidents who were elected by a minority, with a Senate dominated by a minority, even though they have more senators. Do we live in a democracy still? Uh, my conservative friends would say we never did. It's a republic. Um, and well, do we live even in a republic? A well, we, but we've republic. sort of become a democracy because like, you know, no, very few, uh, like a hundred people ever voted for George Washington, right? The electors came and they didn't even have a popular vote anywhere. Just the oh, legislature sure. said. Right. So that was a true republic then, but we've democratized yeah. it. And I think it's a good thing. Yes. Um, it's a real crisis. Uh, and, you know, Madison regretted the electoral college in the Senate as being too skewed towards small states. Um, I, I, when, when we were founded, Virginia, where I now live, was the most populous state, and Delaware, Joe Biden's state, was the least. And the gap, the delta was 12.6. Virginia was 12.6 times bigger than Delaware. Well, today, California is the biggest state, and Wyoming is the smallest, and the difference is 64x. Right. It takes 64 Wyomings to make one. Wyoming has 550,000 people. California is 40 million. There are more people right now. Okay, it's, 10, it's 20 till 5 in Los Angeles. There are more people stuck in traffic on the 405 right now than there are on the whole state of Wyoming. <laughs> and the 405 doesn't get two senators. Now, we can't fix that very easily, although people are talking about statehood for D.C., Puerto Rico, Guam, American Samoa, um, which would help uh, alleviate that. But fundamentally, it also means Democrats have to win in rural states. We can't give up. I, 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 again, I don't advise politicians anymore, but I am allowed to volunteer. So I've done Zoom meetings and fundraisers 
for like Barbara Bollier, this amazing woman in Kansas who's a doctor. She's running for Senate. No Democrat has won a Senate seat in Kansas for 90 years. She's got a real chance. Uh, uh, Teresa Greenfield, who's a farmer in Iowa, who's running against Joni Ernst, she's got a real chance. We have to yes. win in places like that. Al Gross in Alaska is an independent, not a Democrat. But we have to win in places like that. You know, Clinton's economic plan and Obama's health care plan, both passed by one vote in the Senate. And in each case, it was a Democratic senator from Nebraska. Bob Kerry in the case of Clinton, Ben Nelson in the case of Obama. Democrats have to win in places like Nebraska. So they can't just write it off. And, and this is a pointless, stupid debate that the Democrats have. Oh, screw the red states and screw the red counties. And I, no, no. Of course, it's bad morality. It's bad democracy, but it's also it's bad strategy. We can and should be able to win in some of those places. What about deep in the heart of Texas? I mean, that seems like it's the whole ball game if it turns, right? I mean, of course, we've been saying that for since I left Texas in 1994, there hasn't um, been a Democrat elected there. That's right. In fact, uh, William Travis Begala, born in Austin in 1995, is now working for MJ Hagar. And uh, a University of Texas grad and uh, just very nearly perfect. And Billy has never lived a moment on this earth when there was a Democrat elected statewide in Texas. Right. Democrats are 0 for 180. 180 statewide elections since Billy was born. And, but he is in there pushing for- well, That's including the Railroad Commission. Right. And, Everything yeah, though. Right. The Texas yeah. Court of Criminal Appeals, the Land right. Commission, the Railroad Commission, yeah. nothing, nothing. We're 0 for life since wow. 94. Because I think when you left Marinus, we collapsed. Yep. Um, but Beto O'Rourke came closer than anyone has in 25 years. He's two and a half points behind Cruz in a non-presidential year. Um, MJ is running against a less talented senator than Ted Cruz. You like him or not, Cruz knows what he stands for. And he's, I think, very, very gifted. Cornyn, it looks the part. He's just beautiful, but he doesn't really stand for anything. Well, for a typical white country club man, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. But it's, it's, so his job approval is 36. And we're 42 days out. Nobody in Texas knows anything about him or what he's done. And he's been there forever. So I think MJ can win. Uh, almost as important, Beto O'Rourke and Justin Nelson, who came three points from becoming attorney general, they're teaming up to take back the state house. Where last, you know, last time I looked, Democrats were down by 50 seats in a 150 seat body. Now they only have to flip nine. Nine. And in the house? In the house, flip nine seats and they uh -huh. take the state house. And by the way, of those nine, Hillary carried 11. <laughs> so no, she carried more than they need. Hillary did. It is changing so rapidly. So my home county, Fort Bend County, which you talked about, Tom DeLay's home county. He was my congressman for 22 years. It was Republican even when Texas was Democrat. Okay, it went for Ford when Texas went for Carter. It was right wing. It was the most right wing county in the most right wing big state. I believe not only is that my, my district going to go Democrat, the guy who's going to win it is named Sri Kolkarni. Uh, I went back in 2016. And Sri? Sri, S-R-I. His father was an immigrant from India. Born yeah. and raised in Sugarland, but his father immigrated to America from India, seeking the American dream. He ran the last time, and Pete Olson, the old right-wing Democrat, Republican there, who's not running anymore, called him, get this, an Indo-American carpetbagger. Now, Sri speaks eight languages. He served in the Foreign Service all around the world. He's an absolute genius, but born in that district. Sri's answer was, was twofold. First, I was actually born in this district and you weren't, bucko. Um, and second, you know, my dad came here seeking the American dream and I'm very proud that he came to Fort Bend County. He said, by the way, you didn't mention it, but my mom, her family came to Texas too. They came a little earlier. Her great, great, great grandfather was a guy named Sam Houston. <laughs> I love this guy. He is a direct descendant of Sam Houston and the son of an uh, Indian immigrant. And uh, so my county, which was rural and it was fine, but it was rural and racist when I was little, let's be honest, is now the most diverse county in Texas and the most prosperous, giving the lie to Trump's thing that immigrants make us dirty and stupid. It's crazy. That place is rich. They got, we didn't even have a, we had one red light in Missouri City, which is actually the town I lived in. I went to high school in Sugarland because Missouri City didn't even have a high school. And I don't think we had, we certainly didn't have a red lobster. I think we had a couple of red lights. And now they have hospitals. Lubies. We didn't have Lubies. We had, we had Al's Barbecue, which is the greatest slogan ever. Al's Barbecue, tender as a woman's heart. 
<laughs> um, I'm glad but, it's but, so it's, but Texas has changed. And, and yes. the suburbs have changed. It's both the patterns of immigration, but also changing attitudes of white people. Yep. If you're white and you have a college degree, you used to always be a, a, a Republican, and now they're flooding. Oh, my God. Nationally, Barack Obama, pretty good politician, lost college-educated white women by eight. And that's good enough to win comfortably because they're a very Republican cohort. So he's minus eight with women, who white women who went to college. Hillary swings that from minus eight to plus seven. Right. So I'm like, whoa, something's going on. Almost well, enough. Trump to helped swing it, right. You bet. It was, it was yeah. coming. It's like bankruptcy, little by little, and then all of a sudden. So yeah. we go from minus eight to plus seven. Guess what? Pelosi wins that cohort by 20. Now Biden is leading by 39. So when you go from minus eight with Barack to plus 39 with Joe, something's going on. And I'm telling you, the, 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 so Texas has a lot of immigrants, a lot of people of color, a lot of college educated white people. Now the, the first two immigrants and people of color have not voted in the past and they, they got to organize them, mobilize them, motivate them. But Sri is campaigning in at least eight languages, maybe 10. And I bet you he wins that seat. Let's watch to see if Tom DeLay's seat goes to Sri Preston Kolkarni. Well, there's some incredibly uh, smart uh, young Latinos in Texas too, from Lena Hidalgo in She's great. Houston, who seems great on television. I haven't met her yet. Um, I haven't to met the her. She's Brothers one of the, and, the biggest county in Texas, bigger than half the states yeah. in the union, and she's doing a yeah. great job. Yeah. She's not even thirty. Right, I know. She's fantastic. So, but, uh, Rafael Anchea is a state representative yeah. from Dallas. Obviously, the Castro brothers very famous. There's yeah. a, there's a lot of there's a they've they developed are. a bench that they did not used to have. Yes, they used to just have Cisneros, basically, right. for a while. Yeah. Um, yeah. But explain to people who don't, who can't get their mind around the idea of so many Hispanics vote supporting Trump. Yeah, because of his immigration policy. How, how do you explain that? Well, it's a couple of different things. You know, the, I'm more familiar with the Mexicanos, Te, Tejanos, as they call them back home, the yeah. Tejanos I grew up with, who are from Mexico, and you know, it's like America. Uh, a white guy in Houston is more conservative than a white guy in Los Angeles. Mm. And so is a Mexican family who moves to Texas can be more conservative because they're generally more from the interior than a coastal Mexicano who moves up to California. So some of it just cultural, there's more, you know, it's a diverse, complicated country. And so a lot of the Mexicans who came to Texas came from political backgrounds who are more conservative. That's number one. Number two, a lot of them don't like undocumented immigration and they're worried about it. Um, there are some with the men who like all that strongman stuff, which again, it's why I think Lincoln Project is good to deflate that rather than us, my side, inflating it. Um, and then some of it, I think, um, I think it's Julian Castro who coined this term, but maybe not, hispandering, right? That the Anglo politicians come to them and only talk to them about bilingual education or immigration or whatever. Mm -hmm. By far, the number one issue for Latinos is healthcare. Right. By far, and so, uh, you know, I, I think, I think Democrats have gotten smarter about that. Now, Florida is a totally different problem. Right. Because that's that's more obvious with the Cubans, and Cubanos, the and Venezuelans who are fleeing a vicious Marxist dictatorship. So, yep. Trump's going to them and saying socialism, socialism. There is also this cohort of Puerto Ricanos who came after Maria who I thought would have just been natural Democrats because they, they are in New York, right? But this is democracy at its best. Rick Scott, not a guy I particularly like politically. He actually worked that community though. He did his job as a governor and welcomed them and helped them. And just, he, seriously, I mean, I don't support him, but that's politics at its best. That's a way to, to, this is a far better model for the Republicans. Actually, Reagan used to say, Hispanics are Republicans. They just don't know it yet. And that's, that's a far better model. Bush had that model. And Trump has eliminated it. But it, I, I think Democrats should focus more on health care with all voters. Going back to where we started with the Supreme Court, we talked about it in terms of the presidential race. What about those key Senate races, which is maybe as important or more important? Um, I guess Cory Gardner just said that he was going to support the, the vote. Oh, I haven't um, even seen that yet. He was yeah. waffling over the weekend. Right. Uh, which you anyway, can't. How does that affect those five or six races that will make the difference this year? Again, if the Democrats simply say, oh, Senator Cornyn is just in lockstep with Trump, I I'm unpersuaded. Trump got a lot of support in Texas. 
And in every swing state, he's, you know, maybe 45, but he's got a lot of support. It's far better to make it about healthcare there too. And, and if you're running against an incumbent senator, you know, John Cornyn has a sweet deal. His health care can't be taken away. You know why? Because he's a senator. But he wants to put someone on the court who's going to take yours away. Such a deal. I, I think if you personalize it to the incumbent, which is true, I used to be on that plan. <laughs> Senators have the best health plan in the world. But the, some of them, like Cornyn, are in court or supporting court action to take your health care away. I think that's how, what you do. They're trying to rush this thing through. The same way I would do it with, with Biden. Um, uh, and the piece about the money is really big. Voters quite rightly believe that, uh, that, that scripture is right, that the, the want of money is the root of all evil and that these folks are bought off. It's not that you know, John Cornyn is not a bad human being. He doesn't sit around gleefully hoping people die of COVID or lose their health insurance, but he's a captive. He's a captive of the dark money corporate lobbies. And so that's why he does what he does. And I think if you explain it to people that way, it's, I think it's more honest and accurate. And I think it's very politically compelling too. I have grandchildren um, who are now teenagers, unbelievably, wow. who are more committed and activists than any generation I've seen. And I think that that cohort goes from them all the way up through 25 or so. Um, and that's, that's, it could be a huge wave. Is there any more hope this year that it will be a wave than it has been in the past? In terms Absolutely, because it was in 2018, even without a presidential campaign. You know, um, young people surged, and I'm completely with you on this, David. As a 59-year-old, when I was a senior in college and I was a student body president, Ronald Reagan came and had the biggest rally you ever saw at UT Austin, and he carried the campus. Unimaginable now. But my generation was the Reagan generation, and selfish. It was all about money and me. And I've taught now for 22 years at UT, at University of Georgia School of Law, and now Georgetown. So I know hundreds and hundreds of folks in that generation. And then I have four boys, ages 20, 22, 24, 28. Mm -hmm. And so through them, I know, you know, that's more, this is the most, this is the greatest generation part two. I, I'm totally with you on this. I know it's like old guys like us are supposed to piss on those kids, but they're so much better generation than mine. And interestingly, they're not blowing up the ROTC building, by the way. They're not denigrating soldiers. They're really patriotic. They're registering and they're protesting. And by the way, this protest has been overwhelmingly peaceful. They're so patriotic. And this is why actually I'm so concerned, A, about winning and B, about it being a legitimate election. Because if you lose the popular, if you win the popular vote six out of seven presidential elections, and they do again this one, it'd be seven out of eight, absolutely unprecedented in American history. If you get the vast majority of votes for senators and yet you still don't get power, I really don't want these kids to have a crisis legitimacy of democracy. They face one in terms of capitalism, they do. They're far less believing in capitalism than my generation. And also faith, I'm a very faithful Catholic. All my kids went to Catholic high school, but a lot of younger people are much less into organized religion than I am. So the third great institution is democracy and God bless them. They may have less faith in business and they may have less faith in the church, but they still have total faith in democracy. And that's what's gonna save us. You know, whether you wanted to admit it or not, Paul, you were born, what, 61? 61. Well, that's the last year of the baby boom generation. I'm a baby boomer. A lot of the people listening tonight are probably baby boomers in Madison. So I won't tell them what you once said about that generation. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I wrote that. <laughs> Except that ago. it had something to do with a garbage barge, as I yeah, recall. Yeah, <laughs> I, 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 I am in the baby boom, but I've been at the back end of it the whole time, and it has been a challenge. But... You know, I really do think this next generation is remarkable. And it's interesting. I saw, I won't say who, but one of the most prominent conservative commentators yesterday. And we have kids exactly the same age. And all he wanted to do was complain about young people. And he's like my age. I mean, that, and I said, I don't know, like, and his kids are wonderful. It's like, I don't know who you're hanging out with, but I have the exact opposite view. Yeah, me too. I, I, I watch my kids. I'm so proud. Three of my four boys are already working in democratic politics. My oldest son works for the governor of the Commonwealth of Virginia. Billy, I told you about working for MJ Hagar. My next son, Charlie, just graduated with a statistics degree. And rather than go to Wall Street, UVA, he went to work for Garen Hart Yang, the polling firm. Uh, and so he's a pollster. 
Um, and my youngest is still just a sophomore, but uh, he's yeah. going to vote for president for the first time in his life. Great. Well, you've, we've sort of answered my next question, but because of that younger generation, but you know, a lot of people, I would include myself with this, have struggled to be an optimist in the last year. Is that, I mean, I always think of you as the ultimate optimist. How has it affected you? I am, and I waver, but you know, I, I have a great mom. I went and had lunch with her today. She's 84, and, and, uh, and, and I've brought my 20-year-old son. So Patrick and I had lunch with Emma today. And she looked back on 84 years of living, and she said, I know we have problems, Patrick, but your country is so much better than mine. And told him stories, eye-popping stories about the prejudice that she said. She grew up in New Jersey. And the prejudice she saw as a child, it was sure. commonplace. And so she looks back on 84 years and, and she's very progressive. If you think I don't like Trump, you should talk to my mom, but very hopeful, very optimistic. And that, what, that's what keeps me going. Um, it, it really is. It's, it's watching how young people decided that they would get better, not bitter after yeah. Trump came in. And that was not uh, my initial reaction. Believe me, I, I had a really tough time uh, uh, accepting that, that, that one election. thing that, that sort of broke my pessimism was, you know, after Kenosha in my home state, there seemed to be this retrograde sense that this was going to be 1968 again, and it would all break for Trump on law and order. Um, and that all of the progress we've made on civil rights with so much to go in the the positive aspects of the Black Lives Matter movement, which are enormous, could be uh, cut, you know, significantly. But that did not happen. No, and I, 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 I'm so impressed that white people have taken up this cause. Black Lives Matter is not only just supported by white people. I saw a poll. I think it was from Pew. Fifty-eight percent of cops agree with the statement that Black Lives Matter. Cops. So this is not, you know, Mayor Daley turning loose the thugs on peaceful protesters. It's Trump doing it. But you know what I mean? It's not, it's not, even the cops are not as Well, the cop unions seem to be there, but. The big problem with that, you're right. You know, that's th th a big problem. But I, I, I think this has been a broader uh, coalition in getting back to the election. It actually has benefited Biden. People thought it would hurt him. Um, but, you know, people are smart. And this is not 1968. And, and I think Trump sounds too much like George Wallace. And, you know, when I was working for Clinton, nine out of 10 voters were white. 87% literally, but almost nine out of 10. Nine out of 10. It's going to be fewer than seven out of 10 this time. That's a big difference. It's not the same country. You know, it, it, and that's 92. It was 87% white. Go back to Roosevelt's day. Obviously, it was 95 because we didn't have civil rights laws. So this is a really different country. And yeah, Trump snuck the goods through customs with that racism last time. But I, I, I just, I'm not at all convinced if my side does its job and the Democrats do their job that it's gonna work twice. Paul, I'm gonna close with uh, some blurbs from your book, not the blurbs <laughs> themselves, but the blurbers. You had, of course, Bill Clinton. And of course, your wonderful partner for all those years, the crazy James Carville. And um, you had uh, Nancy Donald Pelosi. Trump, Donald <laughs> Trump, Nancy Pelosi. But my favorite had to be uh, Willie Nelson. Um, so I'm wondering, did any of your kids ever go up on the roof of the White House and smoke dope with Willie <laughs> Nelson like Jimmy no. Carter's kid did? I'm still, this is why I'm not really a baby boomer. I've never smoked weed. I'm not a dope guy. Um, <laughs> And I hope my kids aren't. Sorry, I'm not into that. But, uh, I, I, didn't, you know. I sent it off. I sent the, the book to all those people. Uh, yeah. and, and I know Annie and his wife and Willie a little bit. And I was terribly concerned because we're on the 35th anniversary of Farm Aid coming up very soon. Right. And Willie knows and cares about family farmers in a way that a lot of liberal elites don't. And he gets it and he has real appeal. And so I was really interested, honestly, in his take. I was very happy that he liked it. Um, President Clinton, of course, called and went over the whole book for two hours. What about this? <laughs> Say that. He's my, book, he my yeah. book editor. 
Right. It's such a, that, we still stay very close, David. I, I, in fact, when my Billy I mentioned before graduated, they let me be the commencement speaker at UT. And so I wrote this speech and I was, it's most like emotional thing I've ever done. And so I sent it to him and he worked on it longer than I did. That speech was more written by Bill Clinton than by me. He's the most generous uh, mentor you could have. And so he was very kind about the book, but helped. He made, he made, made it a much better book too. Well, um, you're not fired, Paul. <laughs> um, <laughs> come back to Wisconsin Book Festival whenever you'd like. And David, this thanks is... for this hour. It was great. Thank you. I can't wait to come in person. Yes. We'll go to the log cabin in Baraboo. It's my favorite it's restaurant. Well, David, Paul, thank you so very much for being here tonight. Um, it was an absolutely perfect conversation. Um, Paul, I know you have to go um, do this all over again for a national audience. David, it's great to see you. Um, I hope that um, the next time I see you, it's at Madison Public Library, but um, I hope that you're both safe out in the Mid-Atlantic. Um, and thank you everyone for being here tonight. Okay. Have a great um, night. Thank you, David, thank you very much.